Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Hello and welcome to Northern Lights. My name is Nancy Gibson, a co-founder of the International Wolf Center and an author about, on a book of wolves as well. My third friend here is Chance. He's a rare Arctic wolf. So you can imagine today our topic is wolves. We have an interview with Dr. Dave Meech, the world's leading wolf biologist, and we're also going to be discussing a little bit about my book and the Inter International Wolf Center. So stay tuned. We're sitting in the office of the world-renowned wolf researcher, Dr. L. David Meech, who has just published his ninth book uh, in December of 2000. It's a great book. I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you. Um, but what I really liked about it was that it was so well-rounded. It included not only the wolf, but the whole circle about the wolf. Well, why did you decide to do it that way? Well, the, the wolf doesn't live in isolation, as you know. and. Um, I mean, it, it lives on deer and moose, and uh, in its whole life cycle it includes ravens and eagles and all of this. And so uh, to actually talk about the wolf, you have to talk about all these other creatures that are in association with it. And now how did you get all the other writers involved in, in this book? I know you're the primary writer, but there were a well, lot of others. Well, they were pretty eager to, to join in because most of them have worked on wolves, or all of them have uh, worked on wolves in Minnesota. Uh, most are my former graduate students, and um, it was kind of like old home day to, you know, to get together and say, well, you write this chapter and you write that one, and, and um, they were all real pleased to join in. Was there anything new for the public in this book? Oh, yeah. I think the whole, uh, the whole thing is new in terms of putting everything together. I mean, you know, the public has heard bits and pieces of, about the wolf story over the years, but uh, this is really the first book that that looks at the whole history of um, wolf management in Minnesota, the history of uh, wolf populations in the state, and um, especially the development of, of the recovery of the wolf uh, in Minnesota. Do you think with this book, um, the controversy about wolves, some of this will be settled in that if they if they truly read all those words? <laughs> I don't think. No, I don't think that there's any controversy that's going to be settled. But I think for the uh, for the, the neutral public, public the, the folks who uh, don't have kind of a, a vested interest in the thing, uh, in the wolf, um, I think that they, they'll look at the whole story and, um, and will be able to come to some reasonable conclusions of their own as to what's going on and, and maybe how the wolf should be managed in the state, because that is controversial. You know, half the, half the public uh, thinks that the wolf should be allowed to um, move into the entire uh, rest of Minnesota, whereas another half of the public thinks they ought to be kept right where they are now. And I think if folks read this book, they'll be better able to make up their minds on that issue. You mentioned um, this neutral audience. Was, was this book for uh, a, an older age group, somebody who has some sort of education with wolves, or do you really feel it's for the general public? I think it's pretty much for the general public. Um, the, um, the the people there there are some people who have had a, a strong interest in wolves over the years, and uh, they'll know quite a bit of what's in there. But they probably won't know um, some of the 
conclusions that that you might get drawn to by by looking at that picture. Um, and there'll be an awful lot of people who will be surprised at things like the idea that um, it's it's really hard to um, reduce a wolf population, for mm -hmm. example. I mean, we're so used to thinking in Minnesota and elsewhere that the wolf is such a fragile species because it was, uh, you know, in the in the late 60s and early 70s, there really weren't very many wolves left in, in the United States. And um, in Minnesota, they were down to about 650 animals and all. And at that time, um, you know, we all tr we tried to protect them. The government protected them by putting them on the endangered species list and all. And um, the public was led to believe that this animal was on the edge of extinction in the state and all that. Um, but things change when the, when a population increases to a certain point. Um, then it's not so fragile. In fact, um, if you look at something like zebra mussels and and you know some of these creatures that are, uh, are have really taken over, uh, it's very hard to control some populations when they get high enough. And we're kind of at that point, in my opinion, uh, with the wolf. And I think this is going to surprise a lot of people. And by when you say surprise, will they be angered? Or? No, I don't. No, not necessarily. Uh, but I think that um, it's it's when I say surprise, it means they're going to have to shift gears in their thinking a little bit. Instead of thinking of the wolf as a very fragile animal, which again it was when the population was low. Uh, to an animal that's a rather robust creature, one that's resilient and able to contend with almost anything you throw at it, as long as you have a large number of animals. And we do in Minnesota with 2,600 or so. I noticed in the book you really spend a lot of time talking about population of wolves and not individual wolves, which I tend to see a lot of the conversations about wolf management is going in, are going in that direction. Yes, and, and one of the reasons that we do that is because uh, wolf populations, like, like a lot of other, or most other wildlife populations, have a really high annual turnover. That is, uh, about half of the population that's here today will probably be gone in a year. And so if you focus on an individual uh, and try to save at each last individual, um, you know, your focus is kind of in the wrong place because half of them are going to be gone anyway. And in another year, half of them are going to be gone. So, so in three or four years, you're, you're almost a complete turnover in the population. So biologists tend to think more in terms of the numbers in the population and that you need to save that population, but not necessarily each last individual in it. Yeah, that's difficult to convince the public because they tend to get focused on one animal a absolutely. and that's, that's plight yeah. of that one animal. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and that that's very logical because, um, you know, we as the public, we have dogs and cats and pets and stuff and we take care of them, we subsidize them, and if we do the job right, they live with us for 10, 12, 15 years. And so we tend to think of animals uh, in that way. But in the wild, it's just entirely different. There's a huge uh, production of wildlife every year, and there's a huge loss of it, and that's mm -hmm. the annual turnover. And um, so it's, it, it's different, but it's hard for the public to know that. Now, this book is primarily focuses on Minnesota. It does, yes. Do you think it'll have appeal beyond our borders? Oh, I think it will, simply because Minnesota's been looked at from all over the world as kind of the, the model for uh, wolf management and wolf recovery and, and all that. And, and um, certainly it's not just the people who live in Minnesota who are interested in Minnesota's wolves. Uh, people have watched Minnesota for the last 20 or 30 years, watched Minnesota's wolf population develop and all. So yeah, I think that there will be um, a lot of interest in this book and in Minnesota wolf population from all over the world, really. So can you take a, what you've learned all, for all these years, what are there, 40, you've almost worked on wolves 40 years? Probably 42 now. 42 mm -hmm. years. So the information that we're seeing in this book, can you, can you take it to other places around the world? Oh, I think so. There's a, there's, there's a lot of parallels. Um, Spain would be a good example. Spain has about 2,000 wolves, not, not too much unlike Minnesota. And... Um, those wolves have recently uh, recovered uh, from a, a low population, just as ours have, uh, and now they're spreading into farming, farming country, into wheat fields, um, 
places where there's no trees at all. They're learning how to cross interstate highways on the bridges, no less, crossing <laughs> right over the, the highways. And um, a lot of the things that are going on there in terms of the way the public looks at the wolf in Spain is similar to, to the way much of the public looks at the wolf in Minnesota. That is, you get this strong division. Part of the public in Spain uh, thinks that uh, the wolves are still endangered and another part think that, no, we better start controlling them and a lot of parallels there. The wolf is always, um, almost has these separate cultures uh, and I, you addressed them in the book, but there's, there's the agricultural culture and they're interfacing with wolves and there's this culture of people living that don't live in the woods that have a whole different view sure. of, of the wolf. How, how do you get those to match, how to mix and match? Oh, so I'm not sure you can, <laughs> you know. I think um, you will some. I mean, obviously, um, uh, it's happened actually over the last 20 years or so. Uh, when I started here, uh, you, you didn't find many farmers who were willing to say that, um, you know, they don't want all the wolves wiped out, they just want them controlled. Most of them would be saying, we want them wiped out, we don't okay. want them at all. And, and they've kind of softened that view and they're, they're saying, you know, we don't want to wipe out the wolves, we just want them controlled. And also in, in the city now, we're seeing a lot more people who are interested in wolves that weren't interested in the past. And some of those folks are starting to see how uh, the farmer looks at the wolf. And, and sometimes that's because um, some of the city folks have uh, cabins up north and they have dogs and pets and children. And, you know, if their dog gets threatened or killed by a wolf, then all of a sudden they see what the farmer's got to put up with and so so we do see some changing of opinions uh, over the years. Do you think that um, Minnesota is going to, has a good future with wolves and will have a steady place for them to yeah, live in the future? Yeah, I, I really think the future is quite good for the wolf in Minnesota. If, if we don't, you know, if we don't let it get to the point where it it's really does start threatening a lot of the, the dogs and cats around town and stuff because eventually wolves can get close to the city and the suburbs and stuff, and, and then we might see a backlash. So I, I would like to see that um, avoided if, if we possibly can. Right now, I think we're in reasonably good shape. That is, the wolf is living primarily in wilderness, um, fair amount of wolves in, um, in semi-wilderness, and they're starting now to invade the agricultural areas. But, but I think in general, you know, a high percentage of the population is still in, in wild lands. And that's where I think they can live without too much conflict with humans. What's the closest uh, a wolf has been to the Twin Cities that, that you know of? Well, I know of one that was radio tagged in Wisconsin and um, it dispersed from um, somewhere in northern Wisconsin and came down to within 19 miles of the, of the capital of St. Paul. Uh, it got into Hugo, a little town up mm -hmm. there by White Bear, and um, it actually spent a couple of weeks there. Uh, headed over to uh, Forest Lake near the Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area, hung out there for a week or so, and then decided it really, this wasn't the place for it, and it headed back up into Wisconsin. <laughs> there have been a couple of wolves killed, one at Carlos Avery and one at Forest Lake. Uh, there was one killed just west of the Twin Cities um, two years ago now, a little town called Howard Lake, I think, just west of the Twin Cities. So, you know, they've come fairly close. Oh, and I had a satellite collar uh, on, a, on a wolf um, that's a collar that, um, it's a radio collar, but it's tracked by satellites and, and then the data is sent back to my computer here. And that wolf um, just um, wandered through the, the northern suburbs of the Twin Cities and then it headed back out towards um, Camp Ripley. Hmm. So they've, they've come fairly close. And are those wolves getting into trouble with livestock? Is there any uh, Actually, no. I mean, most of those have not. But they were just passing through. and. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, they may spend a day or two in some of those areas and or a week or whatever. If they start living there on a year-round basis, that's when they start getting into trouble. But it does seem to be true that as wolves pass through an area, um, we haven't seen that much trouble with them. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, with your writing, do you feel like you've made an impact with well, changing I hope people's I, yeah. attitudes? That's all I can say, you know. Um, there, there have been changes in attitudes. Um, I've written a lot of material uh, that I hope changed some attitudes, uh, and um, and so it's nice to conclude that maybe I had some kind of influence, but it's really hard to know, you know, because there's been a lot of media. Um, the Wolf Center's done a lot for the for the wolf, and um, 
you know, I'm just one of many people. You yourself have done a lot for wolves, and so I'm one of many people who've worked in the field, and I like to think I've had some impact. The first book you wrote, uh, The Wolf, sold how many thousands of copies? Oh, that's over 100,000 now. Yeah. So that has that's sort of been uh, the Bible of the wolf yeah, world, I guess. Yeah, that's what they've called it. Yeah, it's still in print, actually, Right. You know, 30 years. And then that's, that's pretty amazing. Do you ever expect to, is the information in there, it's old. Or do you have any it intention sure to have to update some of that information? Uh, or yeah. does this book update uh, a lot of it? I, I really do. Um, fortunately, uh, even though the information is old, uh, what we've learned since that time that I wrote that thing, which really was in 1968, it was published in 1970, but I had the manuscript done in 68, um, that information is, is still valid, really. What we've learned since that time um, is more, are more details, so that we knew the, the basic outline of what was going on when I finished that book. Um, but we have filled in a lot more of the fine structure mm. uh, and what we know about wolves. So uh, I want to do that with that book, yes. So someday I want to go through it, you know, with a little yellow highlighter and say, this has got to be changed <laughs> and add here and that kind of thing. Right. I hope to do that. That's good. One question that I get a lot, and I'd like to hear your response to it is, and it wasn't in the book, I'd like to see it in there. If you see a wolf in the wild, what do you do? Oh, well, you, you just jump up and down and say, hey, that's great. <laughs> there's a, well, there's then the a, wolf will move. <laughs> well, uh, you're saying, what, what do you do if, if, there's, if you encounter one, say, right. close up or something right. like that? That would be pretty rare, actually. Um, most often, wolves see or hear you or smell you and, and run away. They're, they're quite afraid of people in most cases. Um, but I if you should see one and, and you're, say, on a portage or something like that, and, and, and you happen to see one and it doesn't run away, I would just stand there and look at it and try to take a picture of it and, <laughs> and um, just enjoy the moment. So no fear should be involved? Oh, I wouldn't be afraid of, uh, of wolves. No, um, you know, there's been... 19 or 20 million visitor days recorded in the Superior National Forest that's, that's always had wolves and nobody's turned up missing or they don't find any, you know, anyone killed by wolves up there. It's pretty rare for, for wolves to be dangerous to people. You know, I wouldn't leave, uh, if I lived in wolf country, um, say the outskirts of Ely or something like that, I, I would not allow my, uh, say if I had a, a little toddler, a four or five year old toddler, I wouldn't allow them the child to go unsupervised in the backyard or something, but I wouldn't allow that anywhere. I mean, there's dogs and bears up there and stuff like that, and so um, that's about all I would worry about is if it was a real small child or something. One of your other major accomplishments is the International Wolf Center, uh, built up in Ely and opened in 1993, and um, I think too that's had an impact. I know the royalties from this book go to the Wolf Center, which is... Yeah, that's true. Is, mm -hmm. it, ...is extremely generous. How do you work with the Wolf Center in making sure that all the information gets is correct and... Well, and I, I review an awful lot of what they write, for example, for their website and uh, all of what goes into the magazine International Wolf. Uh, I'm the technical editor of that, and so I review all that actually two or three times. Um, and anything they do that uh, that's really very technical, I, I get a chance to look at and try to go over it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is probably the most credible organization then that if well, you want like to, to, I think so. deal with sure. I mean, that's what we're trying to make it is the most credible and uh, its its mission is to provide accurate objective information about the wolf, not propaganda, not um, not the not you know the kind of slanted information that just tells one side of the story or mm -hmm. something, but but we try to tell, you know, both sides or all sides or whatever. You gave some hints in your book about uh, seeing wolves, how to see wolves, and you talking about tracks and whatnot. How would you tell a person that was very interested in wolves? They read, they read your book. Where, what would you tell? Where would you tell them to go? Well, if it were if it were in Minnesota, uh, and they were they were wanting to see wild wolves, uh, first of all, I tell them the chances aren't very good. But, but I would go up near the Wolf Center, and there's an area uh, between uh, the Wolf Center and the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, the Fernberg Road, where there happen to be a lot of wolves, and they cross that road quite regularly. And, and of the, all the reports that we get of people seeing wolves, it's, it's in that Fernberg Road area. Um, so I would just tell them to get in the car and kind of 
drive slowly around dusk um, up and down that road and look at stop at some lookouts and stuff and mm -hmm. and listen for some howling and that kind of thing but you know I, again the chances aren't very good if they were going to go elsewhere than Minnesota then I would tell them to go to Yellowstone Park because in Yellowstone people fairly regularly see wolves especially in winter and like March and April that time of year. If you could um, summarize some issues that you've been dealing with that you really want the public to know about wolves, what would you say? Well, of course, there's so many things. Um, I, I'd certainly want them to know there, there's still so many people, uh, and this is shown from surveys and all, um, who, who believe that the wolf is dangerous to, to people. And, you know, I, again, I'd, I'd, I'd just repeat that um, in general, that certainly isn't the case. It's just under very rare circumstances where they, you know, they, they might, um, if they're tame or something, and there's a, and there's a small toddler or a child somewhere, you'd have to watch to make sure that uh, the child is not left alone in wolf country. But um, I, I'd, I'd want to reassure people that you know wolves are not dangerous to humans. What's in the, your future for writing books? Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I've been working on one for about five years. That's, um, I'm trying to, along with a whole bunch of other people, Luigi Boitani is a co-editor with me. And he is from? Uh, he's from the University of Rome in Italy. Oh. And um, we've worked together since the early 70s, actually. I went over there in 74 and helped him get started radio tracking wolves. And we've in been Italy? In, in Italy, yeah. We've been colleagues for all those years. And um, so we're co-editing a book that will be published by the University of Chicago Press whenever we get it done. And there's about 12 authors there, like a couple of authors for one chapter and some other author for another and that kind of thing. And then uh, I'm a co-author on three of the chapters. And um, we're hoping to have that manuscript submitted in about one year now. It's getting close. So hopefully that'll even give us more information about wolves, a worldwide yeah, perspective. Yeah, that's a worldwide look at the wolf. Uh, hopefully everything anybody knows about it. <laughs> that's All great. between two covers. Oh, wow. That'll be great. Well, I hope to interview you then. <laughs> well, that would be fine. I'd like that. Great. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Wolves are an extremely popular topic uh, for books, and I also wrote a book in 1996 titled Wolves by Voyager Press, uh, but I took a different uh, strategy than Dave Meach did. I decided instead of just focusing on Minnesota, I focused on global uh, species around the world, the subspecies of wolves, and so I delved into that sort of topic on the different types of wolves that live around the world and the different types of attitudes about those wolves. I start out with a little what I call lupine lore, some of the legends about wolves, and then finish up with some of the reality. Uh, wolves had just been reintroduced into Yellowstone and Idaho, and I was fortunate to be part of that team, so I talked about the reality of reintroducing wolves back into the wild and what that means to live with a wolf. So a little unlike uh, our doc, Dr. Dave Meech's new book, but still a good type of book for someone who wants good general information about wolves, not too scientific, and it can really uh, be read by a variety of ages. If your interest has been piqued by these wolf books that we've been discussing, you're very fortunate to live in Minnesota because we have the International Wolf Center that is based up in Ely, Minnesota. The International Wolf Center was founded because the Science Museum of Minnesota had a fabulous exhibit called The Wolves and Humans. And from that, the International Wolf so Center was born. 
and that was back, uh, we opened our doors in 1993. And from that moment on, at least 50,000 people have come up to explore the wolf world. And they start by coming to the International Wolf Center, learning a little bit about wolves, seeing our live wolf pack, and then going out into the wild, perhaps, to howl with wolves or learn a little bit about wolf country. We're very fortunate that Minnesota is the focus of all the wolf research, really, from around the world. And the International Wolf Center has a large collection of some of that information, and we've taken that information and brought it to you. Our mission is teaching the world about wolves. We not only focus about Minnesota, we can talk to you about Yellowstone, the Mexican wolves, the red wolves. It's really an incredible topic, and it's an animal that has, has so much interest and so much legend behind it. And from that, you'll learn all about that when you come to the International Wolf Center. One of the most popular parts, though, are our five live wolves. This summer, we added two Arctic wolf pups, and uh, they are, have really livened up the dynamics of our wolf pack. They're white, and you will see them along with the typical gray wolf that you would find in Minnesota. So we do a lot of programs about the live pack that we have, and we even have a wolf feeding program on weekends. So if you want to learn a little bit more about the International Wolf Center, check our website at wolf.org or plan your summer vacation to go up to Ely, Minnesota. I've been so fortunate to be able to work with this private captive facility north of the Twin Cities where they house some Arctic wolves. They're quite rare in captivity, only about 50 of them. Uh, are in captive facilities, and this is one of the best. You can see the wolves now interacting with each other and also interacting with me. These wolves have been hand-raised since they were 10 days of age, and that's my preferable method. These animals are not pets. We have to make that very clear. But because they've been hand-raised and they're not nervous about being around humans, we can actually watch them do a lot of their natural behavior. So here the wolves are playing and frolicking through the snow. They love this snow. Arctic wolves have two layers of fur, and this snow is just designed for them. And so they're playing around, interacting with each other, uh, and also with their, uh, the alpha male, who is the darker wolf. All the white wolves out there are Arctic wolves, and they are in a variety of positions in the hierarchy. But the darker wolf is the alpha male, or the leader of the pack. So they're out there frolicking, enjoying all this weather that uh, some Minnesotans like to complain about, but this is designed for winter. That's what these animals are. Thank you, Dr. Dave Meach. That was a wonderful interview, and thanks to you viewers. Please watch us again, and thank you too, Chance. Northern Lights. A Look at Minnesota Books and Writers is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Mm -hmm.